<laughs> okay, Dorothy and Toto, seems like we're gonna have to find our own yellow brick road. Being recorded. And <laughs> it always nice when that just works out like that. And um, we will be sending a recording to anyone who is registered. Um, this recording and all the recordings are also available on our YouTube channel and on our webpage. Um, we do want this to be interactive. We are so excited about our two panelists today. And we want to uh, make sure that you all have the opportunity to ask your questions of them. And so we encourage you to use the Q&A box or the chat box. I'll be monitoring them for questions and we'll try and get them all answered today. So with that, I will turn it over to our hostess, Dr. Monica flippin Wynn. Thank you so much, Katie. And uh, before uh, our panel, our two guests get in, I want to introduce uh, them uh, and then they'll talk about what they do. But it is such an important topic. Uh, this is that time of the year when there are some movements and transitions in our institutions. And uh, with everything, uh, with our current state of affairs, we want to make sure that our institutions remain safe spaces for all of our stakeholders. And our two guests are experts at that. We have Jessica Wise and Jennifer O'Neill. Uh, Jen Jessica is the co-executive director, uh, director of programs at Higher Education Recruitment Consort Consortium. We know them as HERC. Uh, but I, we wanted to give out the uh, full name, you know, how we love acronyms around here. And then also we have Jennifer O'Neill, who's, pro, uh, excuse me, Jennifer O'Neill, Program Manager of uh, Higher Education uh, Recruitment Consortium. Colleagues, how are you today? Super. You got us charged up with that great music at the beginning. Thank you, Monica. It definitely put me in the right frame of mind for our conversation. You are welcome. Well, uh, let, uh, please uh, go ahead, take it from here. We are excited uh, and we'll just keep the gates open so our colleagues can continue to come in. Thank you so much for being here. Great. Thank you so much for having us. Uh, I have to say, when we first talked with Monica about the idea of this session, we went, we, Monica, we went everywhere. We had so many ideas of how we wanted to focus our conversation. And um, I'm really glad we landed on this topic. It's also that much more, like you said, relevant and important. Even with, then six months ago, it feels like the stakes get higher and higher every time we have this conversation. So we really want to thank and encourage the group that's here today to keep those chats coming. And I know you and Katie will be monitoring them throughout. Um, so this is a lively conversation as it is so needed. So as Monica mentioned, we're, the, we're with the Higher Education Recruitment Consortium. For those of you that don't know about us, we're a consortium of over 600 colleges and universities across the US. And that ranges from technical colleges all the way through four-year higher education institutions, as well as some key national labs, teaching hospitals, and other like-minded organizations all working together to advance our mission, which is to diversify the staff and faculty workforce within higher education. Some of the things that we're gonna be bringing into this conversation are um, what we get to view as a coalition because we get to work with this cross section of institutions all over the United States, rural, urban campuses, every kind of campus that you can think of, as well as a cross section of silos that are normally kind of held apart within this conversation. So not only do we get to work with folks in HR and diversity and inclusion and academic affairs, but also some folks that might um, not, we might not always get to chat together, um, let's say compliance as well as some of those other groups. So we're really coming in highlighting what we are hearing and learning from our member institutions and from that perspective. So we hope that we can kind of give an overview and some of the lessons and things and models and, and things that we're seeing now. Um, we do want to acknowledge, of course, that we are bringing in our very specific identities into this conversation. And so we want to invite, as Monica and Katie said as well, that cross-section of identities into this um, into this dialogue here today, because we will bring our biases as we all do to these conversations. Um, and, and as I mentioned before, we also really want to acknowledge that there's a sense of rawness and fatigue um, for many of us in this field and in a lot of higher education. There's a lot of moving pieces, a lot of train, train, changing ecosystems. Um, so we, we want to take a moment and just acknowledge that. Um, but it's also when Jen and I talked about 
Christmas meeting that really for us is the reason to come together even more and create these deeper dialogues because that will um, fortify our work, not just in the information exchange and the learning that can happen, but also that deeper um, kind of resilience that we all need within this space. So thank you again. I'm gonna let Jen introduce herself now that I've talked to her a little too long and then we'll dive into the content some more. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, I'm Jen O'Neill. I am program manager for the Higher Ed, um, Higher Education Recruitment Consortium, or HERC. My background in higher ed is multifaceted. So I have served as faculty uh, at universities and community colleges. I have been a professional advisor. I have worked as a departmental admin. Um, I'm a sociologist who focuses on social inequalities. So my, my hats are many. Um, I'm also a trustee for one of the 58 North Carolina community colleges. Um, education is really what I'm passionate about. And my role with HERC allows me to really affect change in a tangible way. So I can kind of pivot and use all those skills. And I'm really excited about getting to talk to you all today. Um, and just the fact that we will get to have this conversation that can actually have a, a big impact on our individual institutions and our, our own campuses. Um, thank you again to Monica and the Gardner Institute team for having us here today. We're, we're very excited about this. You are so welcome. We're excited. Uh, so we'll just, uh, uh, you can go ahead and dig in. People have questions, but they'll put those in the chat later. Uh, I think uh, just a whole gamut of, of talking about this area, this time of, of year is really important. So uh, we're looking to hear your expertise and what you're talking about. Yeah, so, well, let's, let's start with just a quick discussion of what the landscape looks like. Um, we know that DEI has been, diversity, equity, and inclusion, has been a, a conversation in higher ed for, for quite a while now. Um, and while there's progress being made, we also know that our student bodies um, and diversity in terms of our students is, is far outpacing our faculty uh, and staff hiring and retention. So we have a lot to do. Uh, the, the diversity rates among faculty in the US are, are quite out of whack with the, that's a professional term, uh, with the larger US population. And that divide continues to increase as, as we move up the career ladder. So Again, while we've done a lot of work, there's there's a lot that still needs to be done to make sure that we're reflective of the students and the communities that we serve. Um, one of the, I think, really important questions that we tossed around before um, and was as included before the session was, you know, are the students at the center of the institution's need to create a diverse and inclusive workforce? And I think that's a fantastic question and a really great way to kind of kick off this conversation. So one, we know that there are a lot of real tangible benefits when it comes to um, our students having diverse representation among our faculty and staff. So we know that we see improved outcomes from um, learning outcomes to retention rates, to graduation rate, rates. We know that it gives students a broader exposure to the social world that they're a part of and provides kind of a better, a better working knowledge of the complexities that we all face. Um, and that's something that they then take into the workforce. They also have improved uh, critical thinking skills, more creativity, there's a richer classroom discussion, and all of these things will eventually kind of trickle down into the larger society. So all of these metrics are also things that we use to, to evaluate how well we're doing. Um, so when we gauge our successes, we gauge our productivity, a lot of times we're looking at those retention rates, those graduation rates, those student outcomes. So absolutely, students uh, are definitely at the center of the need to create a diverse, inclusive workforce, but it's about more than just the students, right? So we know that our students are going to serve uh, our communities. We know that we have an increasingly interconnected world and they're only our students for two to four years, maybe a little bit more if they kind of take that, that victory lap um, or they go to grad school. And even then though, we may only have them for, for a couple of extra years or they'll go on to a different institution. So they're out in the world and they are, are impacted and affected by the experiences that they have while they are with us. Um, so we have that opportunity to help shape the people that they're going to become, which then 
shapes the society that they're a part of. And so you know, some of them will even become our colleagues in higher ed, right? So while, you know, of course, student-centered um, outcomes and that student-centered experience is, is paramount, um, it's also a little bit selfish. It's a little bit self-serving because that ultimate outcome is a diverse and inclusive society. So that's, I think, why it's so important that we keep doing the work and that we keep having conversations like this one. Thank you, Jen, for doing that, saying, giving us that good overview. And what we're also seeing at our, our institutions are seeing that this is foundational to be able to survive and thrive in this changing ecosystem. So it is very dynamic. And if we have that rich and um, diverse workforce, we are going to be more resilient coming into, into this work as we go um, forward. And we do sometimes need that um, big change to be able to do that. We wanted to just touch on a little bit here of some of the models that we're seeing and new initiatives that we're seeing across our campuses, because the the although this conversation's been happening for a long time, I think from where we sit, that that deeper dive into the policies, practices, and procedures, people are really taking hard looks at that and doing. You know, we've heard things like the institutionalization of bias and things. Some of these foundational words, and it is it is quite true, um, and it's exciting to see folks really trying to tackle that from many different ways. So that ranges everything from really interrogating the full recruitment selection and hiring process around staff and faculty, looking at every element of that and really utilizing data to make sure that we're being mindful of what's happening through that process and creating, you know, um, stop points along that trajectory where we weren't seeing that happening even, you know, five and 10 years ago, it was, um, it was less um, data driven and there were less triggers um, in terms of stopping those processes. So that's, that is a trend that is very, very promising. And I think really puts in a good way, some very good teeth to some of the, the things we've been talking about, the hiring process and, and the amount of bias there. Another thing that is um, starting to really, people are, are being very creative and thoughtful and um, learning from the mistakes that we've seen in other campuses. Um, when they're creating their hiring initiatives, their diversity hiring initiatives, to really integrate both the department level needs and realities and culture and all those elements that are there and, and look at it from an institutional perspective. So bringing those two sides together, it's never bottom up, top down. And we see that San Diego State is a good example of that with their um, Building on Inclusive Excellence program. And I encourage you, if you're a HERC member, to look at our webinar. If you're not a HERC member, reach out to me or Jen, and we'll get you that webinar on the overview of their process, because um, I think there's some really great lessons there. I, I have a couple more on my list, but I'll just touch on a few of those. Um, I think there's looking at, if we focus on faculty for a moment, looking on at the um, retention and tenure process, there's a, this conversation has been going on for a little while now as well, how to really capture the, D, the DEI work within the retention and tenure process. And people are really shifting those um, parameters and in a way that is um, additive um, and, and really it creates additional value to that process. So we're really thrilled to see that movement. And on a related note, we're seeing a lot of campuses hold in diversity statement requirements into the hiring process. We did a recent um, quick touch poll on our uh, on a webinar and found that over 70% of our members either require or encourage their departments to include the requirement of a statement. That number blew us away. And I think it was, Jen, call me on this, but I think it was something like half of those required it and half of them um, recommended it. And the fact that either of those stats were so high was really phenomenal. We're also seeing that not just happen on the faculty side, but a lot of institutions are looking at um, staff positions to include these sort of statements where appropriate. Um, and, and we're finding that it's appropriate in a lot of places. Of course, that has to be linked back to what we we're talking about in terms of the RTP process. It doesn't do us much good if we don't include that in the review, either from the faculty side or, or from staff evaluations. We wanna make sure that that's an evaluative marker for all of our staff and faculty. Um, and then not to mention the myriad of programs that are really looking to support either prospective or incoming faculty um, that may have barriers um, presented to them or throughout their career trajectory to make sure that when we get folks into our institutions that we're um, enabling them to, we're removing the barriers that would um, 
create problems for them within their their trajectory at the institution. Jen touched on this earlier, but we know that um, we have we have traps where we're not seeing the leadership, um, the diversity um, is trapped at lower levels and not um, expanding to the leadership positions within the institutions. And that's something that we, we wanna see more institutions look at and develop programs around. So that's a, an area for growth, I think for all of us. So well, there's many, many more, and I'm sure your institutions have um, models that you maybe you want to share in the chat. Um, but we will we'll pause there, and we'll see from Katie and Monica what questions are from the group, so we don't we don't um, drown out um, the conversation from our side. Uh, taking a break because that's a a lot of information for our. Uh, colleagues to know, but I do want to tell you thank you, uh, because this is a conversation that's been going on for years, and we can't, I asked our guests uh, a couple weeks ago, I said, why can't we get it right? Uh, what is the, you know, what's the, what does it take? What stakeholders do we need? What policies need to be rewritten uh, for us to be able to have that inclusive, uh, diverse uh, institution of, of stakeholders? that makes all of our stakeholders feel comfortable and they're in a safe space and also provide those learning experiences that everyone can take with them, whether it's a, another job or another institution or the workplace. I mean, I just, you just wonder what, what else needs to be done. So one of the questions is, is what, is a, what does it look like? What does a, a, an institution, you mentioned San Diego State, but what does it look like? What should, be, what should we be looking for to do in our institutions that make them inclusive and diverse? Yeah, um, I wanna acknowledge Lori's question there. Lori, can you add what state you're in? We do have a, a development plan to expand throughout the US. So we can answer that question on a side note in terms of, um, she asks if you don't have a regional HERC, how, does, how do we become that? So we'll answer that question, that's an easy one. Pivoting back to Monica's question, um, this is, let me, let me say that there isn't an answer, right? We have to look at all of our policies. This is an iterative process. You know, that's a, that's a horrible answer to your question, but I think that's the reality. We cannot not, you know, we've all developed virtual um, workforce policies lately. Did we look at those policies through a diversity, equity, and inclusion lens? So we have to keep interrogating um, these policies, practices, and procedures. It won't, it, the work I don't think it will be done, um, but we, we need to look at all of those through that lens. Um, okay, we are in Georgia, so we'll, we'll follow up with you, Lori. Thank you. Um, the other piece that I want to emphasize too is that um, the so the, the work will not be done. And I lost my train of thought, but I will come back to it in a moment. Um, the, the, we need to keep going back to those policies and procedures. Um, Jen, let me let me go to you for a second while I re bring me in my thoughts. And I've just learned my lesson not to look at the Q&A. <laughs> so please go ahead. And then I'll, I'll, I'll remember the other thread that I wanted to pull in. Yeah, I, the Q&A. So uh, yeah. if that does happen, well, yeah. we'll get off of it. So uh, <laughs> no, no problem. Um, yeah, I think that there there really isn't one model, right? Because we all have different needs. We're all kind of situated in different sociocultural contexts. Um, it, I mean, we have to kind of take what works for us. And I think that's why it's really important that we create this network of, of colleagues who can share, you know, what works well on this campus and what works well on others. One thing I will, I will say is in my time at HERC, um, I've learned some really interesting things about um, what works at different institutions. And I will say that um, one of the more interesting things that I've learned is that our colleagues in California have been dealing with restrictions regarding affirmative action since 1996. Uh, and I will admit that I had a kind of bias. And I think a lot of us outside of California have a little bit of a skewed perception of kind of what the political climate looks like out there, but finding out that they have, their institutions have almost 30 years of experience working with their Prop 209, which, which prohibits the state from, from hiring based on race, gender, ethnicity um, in public institutions. And so they have a wealth of information to share with us that again, may not be fully applicable in every single instance, 
Um, but again, we, we take what works for us, we adapt things and that ability to, to kind of share and collaborate, um, I think is how we get to the place we all want to be. And I think that, uh, again, conversations like this, and if you're a HERC member or HERC Connect um, community boards are fantastic places to exchange ideas and to get new resources. Uh, but yeah, I think it's, it's, I wish there were kind of a blanket response, a blanket like this will fix it, but yeah. we're all very different. <laughs> that, that is so true. And I think that that this regionality, I'm sure you've seen this in a lot of your dialogues. I've gotten my thought back. So thanks, Jen, for buying me a little time there. The other thing that we really encourage our members to do is to do be very um, visible with what those those goals are. Um, I think we have a lot of conversation around fatigue and sustaining these efforts. And we know that when we are able to be brave enough to put that information down and make it public, we hold ourselves accountable in a different way. Of course, there has to be resources behind that. Um, one of the places we see campuses fail, unfortunately, is when the desire is there, but there's not the additional resources presented to those campuses. So that so the, the things that we talk about when we do our diversity planning exercises with campuses is figure out where your problems are, rely on that data to identify those gaps, set goals that are achievable, but ambitious, make that public so that you are working towards a collective goal and then allowing for those resources to, to really implement those changes. And all, all four of those pieces have to be in place in order for us to move this needle forward. Um, if we're missing any of those pillars, I think we, we kind of set ourselves up for failure. That, the amount to which you can do all of that goes back to what Jen said. It depends on the ecosystem that you're working on and in, and that we know that that's changing and highly dynamic, but making those pieces public, I think helps secure a little bit of that. But all, again, all four of those pieces need to be in place. You know, I want to, I want to thank you very much for that. And, and also for saying that it's going to look different at every institution. Uh, and so you have to take uh, that into consideration. Uh, Katie has uh, several questions, I believe. Indeed, I do. So um, the first question um, is, how do we implement diversity without introducing reverse discrimination? Mm -hmm. Yeah, we get that question a lot. And I think what we, you know, we go back to the 209 example that Jen mentioned in California, and it really is about removing barriers rather and inviting everybody in to, in order to do that work rather than um, any sort of exclusionary action. So we, we make sure that we're advertising widely. We make sure that we're having a dialogue with a cross section um, of individuals and groups and across the board. And then we interrogate our processes for those introductions of bias, places where bias is introduced to try to minimize it. We won't ever remove bias completely from our processes, but we can minimize them as much as possible. So they're really in that, if we take that approach and that formula, um, it, there's not reverse discrimination. It's the lack of um, that, that, making sure we have that deeper dialogue with um, more people and bringing more people through that process. Thank you very much, Katie. Um, yes, um, at an under-resourced technical college that does not offer faculty competitive salaries, is a diverse and inclusive climate sufficient to attract diverse candidates? And how do candidates who care about culture and climate find colleges that have what they're seeking? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, I'm going to start, but Jen definitely folds in here on this. Um, we we conduct an annual job seeker survey um, that the ends around 1,200 individuals cross section the faculty and staff, all levels of career experiences. So it's a good little pulse check, big big pulse check um, on on the workforce that we were talking about here in your question, Lori. Um, and what we know is that a diverse environment begets diverse staff and faculty. So it is for, especially for um, our my, uh, minority and un underrepresented candidates, that is one of the first things that they look at. So it's, it, unfortunately, it's a little chicken and egg, but if you have a diverse climate that folks can, can see um, that will appeal to um, 
bolstering even further those efforts. Um, but regardless of the background of the individuals, we know that a diverse campus and a, and a rich campus like that is going to appeal um, very broadly. Um, and we can pull those direct stats um, from the polls. We have some notes here and we can do that. Um, but before, before Jen pulls those in, I did also want to talk about um, that second part of your question and how do candidates um, who care about that signal that essentially to their to their candidates and also from that same poll we know that it is it starts and this is no surprise you know well before the the interview process so it's everything from your employer brand what you're emphasizing on your websites what you're emphasizing in your social media um, how your job descriptions are written. So what's the inclusive language that you're including there? What elements of the of the application process um, signal to your applicants that you are an inclusive campus? So do you ask early on what kind of accommodations an individual needs through the hiring process? Do you go beyond EEO language in your job description? Um, do you make sure to manage any sort of um, limiting language within your job description? So we it has to be early on you're being evaluated before um, any candidate comes through the actual um, selection process. But I want to pause and Jen, see if you have anything you want to pull out specific stats that we can share with folks. And we share these with the hope that you'll jot them down or come back to us with questions so that you can use these on your campuses to really fight for those resources that we were talking about earlier. So leverage, leverage the heck out of any stats that we share today. Yeah, so um, kind of to your point or to your question, we are our most recent, we just got finished crunching those numbers just a few weeks ago. So this is this is super fresh data, uh, yeah. which is very exciting. So um, when we are looking at the importance of DEI um, policies and practices and a potential employer, our job seekers responded that 85% um, of our minority and underrepresented uh, participants uh, reported that that is, that is a top concern and 77% for wider Caucasian respondents. So very strong um, for kind of all groups. So that's definitely a big, a big factor in uh, attracting job seekers. I think it's also important to, to point out, you know, I, technical colleges, community colleges are having a harder time with their salary equity at this point. And so I know that there's a lot of kind of poaching happening um, amongst the, the different schools. And one of the things that, that I think is really important from the job seeker survey is to point out that having a diverse leadership team and having a diverse staff and having a positive uh, campus culture, those are, those are huge in terms of our respondents uh, responses on, on the job seeker survey. They're looking at those things. And of course, salary and compensation is, is also up there. But when you can't really, you know, compete in the salary area, you can kind of offset, mitigate some of those, those less positive factors by really focusing in on, on the environment itself and the culture itself. Um, so that's what I would say. And you could also, you know, look at um, different resources that you might be able to offer that aren't necessarily salary-based. So that could be something like you know flexible schedules, work from home, that kind of thing. There are there are things that don't necessarily have to go into somebody's salary number that can be attractive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, Katie. Um, yes, thank you. And how do we create an environment where diverse faculty and staff feel welcome? I think you started to to uh, yeah. talk about some of those points, but maybe go into a little bit more. Thank you. Yeah, I'm going to start with kind of a provocative <laughs> uh, piece of data that we got out of that survey. You know, there's been a lot of attention and focus, and we know a lot of our campuses started um, ERGs or employee resource groups, and we value those tremendously within our community. What we saw from our job seekers is that that ranked very low on their list of what they look at when they're evaluating whether a campus is a diverse, um, a welcoming campus to, your, to how you worded it there. And I think that doesn't discourage us from continuing that work because I think ERGs have real potential for power, powerful impact. But what it does tell us is that people are looking for tangible uh, metrics of it is no longer talk the talk, right? 
people want change. They want to see that happening. And that goes to everything that Jen talked about. So seeing diversity, not trapped at lower level positions, but across leadership, um, making, feeling very confident that um, there's um, equitable salary processes in place and evaluation and transparent salaries, um, if that's um, applicable to your region or your state. And so the, the more tangible ways that we can demonstrate this, there, you know, we're, we're moving away from things that are more um, superficial and, and, and more tangible. So those ERGs, I think where we come back to that um, are a great a resource for us as we're thinking about how this can happen on our campus to figure out what matters to the groups um, that need that additional support. What, what's the value to them and what's really going to make um, a difference in that community with that with that group of folks. So that answer may be different, but we really need to make sure that we're going back to, and, and making those tangible differences and, and not superficial any longer. There's no there's no tolerance or appetite for that um, anymore with our workforce. The workforce is is a lot more um, you know it, 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 a lot less passive than we've seen um, and and it's never been passive, but it's less so now. Uh, Katie? Yeah, I'm, I'm going to share a comment from the chat and then um, see how you all can um, provide some insight. I'm a teacher with the education program in Virginia at Bridgewater College. We're having a difficult time with the Virginia Communication Literacy Assessment, discouraging our teaching teacher candidates, particularly candidates of color and low SES. I've tried to do advocacy work through the Virginia Association of Teachers of English. The, she's the current president. Um, but there are many voices, but there needs to be many voices. The assessment re affects retention. So how would you help them, I guess, or support them? Yeah, that's that's a big question. And Jen, I'm sure has a lot more insight to this than I do. Right off the bat, though, one of the things that my questions for um, our uh, for Jenny, um, is who makes the decision on whether that assessment is going to be included and then really looking at what data they would respond to. If I, I, I'm guessing that this is a pretty standardized assessment. We know that standard assessments have bias in them. So if, is it a matter of sharing the research around um, what's happening with standard assessments? And, and if that's an audience that responds to that sort of information, providing it. If it's an audience that responds to constituency pushback, then we push that lever. So really understanding who, who holds the power um, in this decision. I'm sure you know this well, but from the outside, I don't have a perspective on that. And that would be my first question back to you is where is the power held and what does that power group respond to? And then building a plan based on that. So kind of more of a social change model rather than um, kind of what we might normally approach it with. But Jen, I'm sure you, I'm sure this, this sets off a lot of, a lot of thoughts in your head. So this is so. Correct me if I'm wrong. This is an assessment. I think that is is a Pearson assessment, Pearson Higher Ed. Um, yes. So lots of feelings, I'm sure, about about Pearson and and standardized testing in general, and the biases, like Jessica is saying, that we know are kind of baked right in there. Um, I think that that you know, what people want to see when they're trying to kind of make these decisions as to what they're going to require data. So if you have the data that shows that there's a disproportionate um, effect or disproportionately low scores for candidates of color and for people of low socioeconomic status, then I think you have to kind of lead from that data standpoint. Um, and then my question would then be, you know, are you getting pushback? Are you are you, where's the directive coming from? Because it's a, it's a state level regulation, I'm thinking. Um, so this, I mean, this, this could be policy work on top of, of kind of the practical stuff, yeah. So this, this would be a place where, you know, use that data um, as the president of a professional organization, you've got a little bit of pull there. I would pull in um, different, different voices that can really speak to what the experience is and um, 
again, like just, uh, you just have to rely on that data at first, I think. And then, and then see how many people you can bring to the table to get, to grow those voices essentially. Um, but it is, that's a difficult barrier to be up against when it's a, a state level, um, a state level requirement. And then also with that connection to, to organizations that we know have a lot of kind of power in the higher ed and, and K-12 world with, with Pearson. Just, but, just as a side point, um, there, there's also this, this is such a strange thing to say, but there's also some opportunistic timing here um, that we know that we're not recruiting and retaining our teachers. And so this would be, you know, this is where you got to, hopefully the, the, that's the fire, right? If we can, if we can use this timing to change things, now is a, actually a very good time to lean into this conversation. So I guess I'm saying that to say, keep going, because this is the time that maybe there'll be an opening there that you can kind of pry, pry further. And, and I think that also uh, what you said earlier about not being tired uh, of, of getting frustrated and because it's consuming work. Yeah. Um, so thank you very much for that response. And I, there's a question, but I did just want to ask you, we had an a, a, a institution who wanted to uh, do some different work with their descriptions and job postings and the language and how to attract and what's uncomfortable. So could you uh, talk a little bit about that and how that can make a difference in the candidates who you uh, can get approaching your, your job uh, op options? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that kudos to those campuses that are looking at that and just off of that, we have to acknowledge that some of us don't have a lot of leeway mm -hmm. with our job ads and things like that. So we know that within higher ed, it's a little hard to compete, but there are some best practices that we can model through this. And that's things, you know, everything from really interrogating our language. Um, there's a lot of kind of bias systems out there where you can run that language through, but being very mindful of keywords that you want to really include or not include um, with, with your descriptions. And, and it, there's, there's a lot of pieces to this. One is being very clear what the job description is. I think that's the best service we can have, not just in terms of hiring folks that are great for the job, but allowing them to be retained in those positions as well, because they know what job they're looking for. Really um, doing that work as a committee ahead of time to clarify what the key pieces are, because what we find, we know that when we have um, more than a certain number of job requirements, we tend to lose our female candidates. Um, and because of um, things around imposter symptom potentially, but other factors as well. Um, so it is really critical to look at those. And I think that starts with the committee. So really going back and saying, what are the, what are the most important elements for this position? It's not everything in the kitchen sink. And that, that's always been our best practice. We, we've known that for a long time, but when we think about the fatigue around our workforce right now, that is even more important. So we're saying, what are you gonna be required to do? What are you gonna be evaluated on? Making those metrics very clear from the beginning to make a more successful recruitment and hiring and retention starts at that first, first stage. Uh, the environment is it are, are you you have to be very careful about what you put in your you know you can't say uh you know we want you to come here because of this so you have to find other ways and language and different ways the committee and what you put out there i guess is what i'm also saying is that our committees have to be uh creative um while uh handling all of the requirements and the policy regulations that they have in front of them Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Katie? Yes, we have another question. Um, several years ago, cluster hires and spousal hires were being touted as the best approaches to increasing diversity and creating climates of belonging on campus. How has that panned out in terms of enhancing diversity and improving faculty and staff retention? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so um, there's a lot. Uh, there, it's interesting that I'm going to talk maybe the easier one first with the um, we call them dual career partners or spouse hires um, and and the um, thinking there for folks that might not be familiar with this terminology is that you often had a situation where you had an older male um, kind of 
first out of the gates um, as, as the hire, and then you would have a, a younger female candidate that would be kind of tied to the other person, um, and they would not be retained within the, re the tenure process. That conversation is still very uh, lively, and people have been um, really looking at that Again, I think part of this bigger conversation is that we don't hire individuals, we're hiring whole families. So that's part of it. It's part of the work-life balance conversation. Um, it's, it's, it ha it's coming back up for many, many reasons. Um, what we, where I think we fail in that conversation is that that process is still very much a black box on a lot of campuses. So what we talk to our campuses about is making sure that um, that that's as transparent as possible, um, because we know that when we hold that information, that kind of social capital, we disenfranchise different groups. So where it can be leveraged as a very inclusive practice, um, if we're not careful with the transparency around that, and it can actually be an exclusionary practice, but we, we know that it can be leveraged in very good ways. And we see a lot of our campuses doing using that model very productively and being able to, to um, really bring in a cr wonderful cross sections of individuals, both that primary hire and additional knowledge and experience that they're bringing in with the others. So growing conversation. I'm really excited that people are looking at things like transparency, looking at elements like intersectionality, looking at things like social capital as part of that exchange. So that's that's really exciting that that's happening there. Um, when we look at cluster hires, the, it is a lot more mixed. And what we see is that some campuses, it was tremendously successful. And then some campuses, it really never got off the ground. Um, some of the pieces in Jen fold in here where I've missed things, you know, where we see that there is um, infrastructure behind creating that, because the idea is you have a cohort. But again, if there's no infrastructure or resources behind fostering that cohort model um, and providing additional knowledge and resources back to that group, that's not going to sustain um, that cohesion and that that group and peer um, success. So it depends on one where campus is able to kind of pull that together. Um, and is there a culture that really supports and the infrastructure to support those clusters in order to, to be successful? So it, it's, a, it's a little mix. And I think there are some great best practices to pull out of that um, that we can look at. But Jen, did I miss something on either of those that you want to pull out? No, I think that was that was great. Okay. I agree. Uh, uh, so you've got colleagues. Uh, for some, you know, uh, who are on the job hunt. Um, and there are, uh, uh, there are diversity and inclusive, inclusivity issues, uh, different lifestyles, all of that. Decipher how they should be looking at these, uh, uh, because we're talking from one perspective, but we've got colleagues out there who are you know, I don't, I want to end up where I'm going to feel safe, uh, both in my, the work that I do and the life that I lead and the culture that's here. Uh, and that, and you have ones who, who are colleagues who took jobs last year and said, uh-uh, this wasn't anywhere in, you know, I didn't get that vibe when I was interviewing. Yeah. What's the things um, our colleagues should be paying attention to? Yeah. Um, this is going to sound a little soft, so I'll start with this, but then we'll get more into the nitty gritty. But, but the soft part is really defining what what your per, your professional identity looks like, okay. who you are. So um, really thinking about that, like whether I am I am a teacher at heart, you know, and this is this is my priority as you know someone in the faculty that that's my driver. And therefore, I'm going to look at institutions of this kind or whatever it might be, you know, it might be on the staff side, it might be on the faculty side, it, it really doesn't matter, but clarifying what that professional identity is. Um, I recently did a workshop at an ACE Women's Network session um, where people, we, I asked people to rewrite their LinkedIn headline. And it was, it's hard, right? That's not easy to do. And sometimes you have to put in the third person, whatever you need to do to trick your brain 
to articulate what that professional identity is, is a great first step in kind of cleaning away. Again, we're not in that position where we're just, oh, we're going to take a position that comes to us. We get to be um, more pointed in those searches now. And I think regardless of where you are in your career, really fine tuning that and articulating that professional identity can help you be a more selective shopper when you're looking at institutions. So again, it's a little soft, it's a little kind of um, self helpy but it does really help clarify what you're going to be looking for when you are on the job market. And then what we know from our job seekers is that they do look to current employees for that information. So yes, they're relying on what's happening during the um, selection and hiring process, and that's very important. Um, but we also folks are ground truthing that information and leveraging their professional networks to get those inside perspectives. So whether it's through a group like this or professional society, making sure you're getting that information that goes beyond that hiring and selection process is really, really critical. And then the other part of this is being a very informed consumer, looking at who's in their leadership positions, um, if budgets are public, where their budget allocations are going, um, looking at priorities and really looking at where are they making progress on their diversity and inclusion initiatives um, and, and whether they're public about that. So I think all those things, um, unfortunately, that puts the, the the way I've answered this, it sounds like it puts the onus back on the on the individual. But what I'm hoping is that through Gardner, through her, through these other organizations, our institutions are doing a better job of articulating those elements so that the, the consumer or the job seeker um, can find them more easily and make a more informed choice around that. So I guess what you're, you're saying is that it's not a walk in the park. You are going to have to do your research, uh, have your eyes open, reach out to the people that you know, uh, look at their website. Uh, and who's the chairs of departments, even departments that you're not going in, but yeah. looking to see where leadership and who's representing leadership, uh, looking at their posts and their social media and seeing who's uh, doing what and who do they mention, who they, you know, and that kind of, I, you know, yeah, okay. Um, it is, it, it seems like you just want to, you just want to get the job description and apply for a, a position. Uh, but if you want to be in a safe space that you want to uh, um, feel, you know, that you, because it's not just with our students, you, we want our faculty and staff to feel like they belong. Sometimes mm -hmm. it's work to do. Is that what yeah. you're saying in essence? Yeah, absolutely. And I think it goes, it, it, I want to go back also to that. Yeah, it's a lot of work. And we, we're, we're also finding in the, interview process, ask those questions back to, you know, really kind of signal to the employer what your priorities are. And if, if they, um, they might not know the answer, but if, if there's a negative response to your question, that is information as well. So there's, there's so much data out there and it's really sifting through the things that are a priority to you, where you see the most importance, um, and then, and then being able to, to make that, that, um, that decision. And the, the good thing is that the market will allow that right now. We haven't always had that opportunity, um, but you, you need to be that savvy, discerning consumer. Absolutely. I'd say that the harder you have to look, but let, let how hard you have to seek be a little yeah. part of that litmus test. Yeah. Because the ones that, that are, are doing the things okay. that you would um, expect um, or that you'd hope to see should make it relatively easy for you to find evidence of that. That's a really good point, Jennifer. Thank you very much. Katie, looks like you got a good question coming up. Yes, we do. So STEM disciplines, particularly the hard STEM fields, mathematics, physics, et cetera, have been incredibly resistant to divining their best candidates by any criterion other than research, publications, elite institutional backgrounds, which are all dependent upon accumulated privilege. Do you have any examples of STEM hiring that have successfully expanded their definition of best? 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And this, the, the, yeah, there's so much wrapped up uh, into this conversation, into this question. Um, so, so agreed with so much of what you say here first. So thank you for articulating that in, in a, in a sm- small amount of real estate. We really appreciate that. The accumulated privilege, I think is a critical part of what you're talking about. Um, and it is something that we really see. And that, and that goes back to Jenny's comments about the standard test, like, it, like all the pieces of this um, fold together. And where, you know, I am situated in California. And I think what you know, what we have seen here is a real, you know, and there's a lot of campuses that are doing this well, um, really evaluating um, our faculty hires within the UC, the University of California and California State University system in a more holistic approach um, has, has really changed the face of our faculty. Um, in the STEM science, in the the STEM fields. And that's that's very promising. So I'd encourage you to look at the campuses here for some of that, either through UCOP, which is the University of California Office of the President, um, and some of the initiatives there, or within the CSU system. I'm happy to pull out some examples or campuses to look look at. The flip side of this too, is that I think this is where we can lean very heavily on our professional societies, um, where I think in in many ways, the professional societies were outpacing interest, an interesting dynamic and and Jen probably has a better sociology way to describe this, but their professional societies were actually ahead of the curve with a lot of these practices and making recommendations before the institutions and departments were able to. So this is where we can really go back and rely on those professional societies. I know in the geosciences, for example, there's been a lot of interest there um, in the marine sciences as well. I think across the board with many of our professional societies um, really looking to, to the them leading that conversation and and bringing that information together to bear. But I know there's campus experiences across the U.S. um, that are doing this well, and that's another conversation that I think is really critical for us to rely on Garden, rely on HERT to have these conversations and share those, those, um, those examples question though. Um, It's also sometimes our institutions don't know where to look or how to look. And so the professional societies are the ones that that help with that. But it's also really important um, to to note that people of all our uh, populations are available and qualified. Uh, We just have to find them uh, and they're there. So I think that's the uh, key is that there are no uh, you know, we don't we don't know how to go into different areas. And so sometimes our committees can request information from other people on where do I look? How do I look? How do I get more people of all populations to apply and et cetera? And not always, you know, because we know that there are qualified people everywhere of every uh, population and taking that perspective is, you know, something our, our uh, committees can also do. Yeah, think? and I, I had a reaction to how you, when you said don't know how to look, because uh-huh. I, I think what we do, we do know how to look, okay. whether we prioritize that in the process is a different question. Would you agree, Monica? I'm trying to be kind here. And then yet, <laughs> <laughs> you're absolutely uh, and it's a priority. Um, yeah. But yeah. now, you know, not all the time, though, uh, Jessica, yeah. there may be smaller institutions uh, and the persons in, in charge of the committees are first year or second year, and they don't have the information. Yeah. So that's why yeah. I'm saying all stakeholders who are involved should yeah. get involved. Um, yeah. because, you know, thinking, well, we can't find anybody is maybe because you don't know which crevice or which corner. Uh, sure. yeah. Yeah. So that's all I'm saying. Everybody yeah. doesn't have uh, those same fair enough things. fair enough you're okay. you are kinder and I think that that's right. where things, models <laughs> like equity oh equity advocates are coming into play leveraging mm-hmm. expertise across campus leveraging our sorts of groups is really critical because that information is out there so I agree you you know uh, Jessica if, if we didn't have a kind of perspective that people don't know and if we thought everybody didn't I wouldn't be able to play the kind of music I'm playing. I'd be playing sad songs all the time because that's something we don't want to live in. So I choose to go that other way. Uh, You know, we are at 254 and every time I I get upset because there's so much uh, left to say. So I'd like both of you to take a minute or so and say what you would like our colleagues uh, uh, to know and understand that we had so many... uh, uh, colleagues who register and they will get 
uh, this recording uh, sent out to them later. So what do you want them to know? What, what couple of kernels do you have for them? Jen, do you want to start and then I'll, I'll wrap us up? Sure. Um, I just want everybody to remember that this is the type of work that is never done, right? We, we are continually learning. We are active learners, we're active listeners, and we're, we're trying to increase diversity, equity, and inclusion at our institutions. And it's a fantastic goal. It is not an easy lift, but it's worth it. Uh, so just, I want to encourage everybody to, to keep doing the work. And I know sometimes it feels like we keep getting hit with new new barriers, but collectively we can we can do this. We're gonna we're gonna get to where we want to be. So don't lose hope. Love that. Um, and and that, and I just want to underline that community aspect. I think we've talked about that a couple times throughout today. Is coming together for this piece of it is really critical. The thing that just blows me away, and 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 you, I know Katie and Monica feel this as well, is that this group, this community is very generous. So no one should be starting from scratch or doing it alone. Um, so leveraging those networks to really advance our work um, and build on the experiences of our other campuses, whether those are in our regions or outside, doing that, that reaching that out, being vulnerable and saying, we have a problem here, we need some insights on how to do it, or, hey, we don't have anything in place for this, we need, we need some models here. And um, so that, that not doing it alone, relying on your community is so critical um, and building that, that exchange um, is, is what we'll do to advance this work. I'm gonna throw my email address into the chat and I wanna encourage everyone to reach out, ask questions. If we can provide resources, we will always do so to, or direct you to, to colleagues that might be able to better answer your question. Um, but we just are grateful for the community coming together today and asking these really provocative, interesting, important questions and for, uh, the Garner Institute for hosting us today in this in, in this great um, dialogue. You know, we're we're happy you're here and for extending yourself uh, to our audience because this is important information to have, uh, and they'll have a report, recording to go back to it. So, uh, colleagues, uh, you know, I'm going to reach out again. We're not even going to. I say it all the time, and it's really true. So, just you know, uh, hopefully you'll be uh, receptive to popping up again. Uh, Thank you so much. Katie, do you have anything else you want us before we uh, leave today? I do, Monica. I want you to give everyone, if you don't mind, a little preview of next week's session. It's a special extended session, and we do want to remind all of our regulars that um, this one was added. So when you registered for the whole series, you may not have registered for next week's, but I promise you, like this week's, it is one you do not want to miss. So, Monica? Uh, thank you very much, Katie. Uh, we've got a seven person panel. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, DEI and J the status uh, and also talking about uh, House Bill 999. Oh, look at our ears. Everybody's oh, uh, and, uh, you know, just giving some uh, some time to understand that and how it could possibly influence uh, some of the work that we're doing. So we're really excited about it. If you've not registered, uh, please do. Uh, Katie, Ethan, Rob, thank you so very much. Brittany, thank you. Uh, we will see you next time. Everyone have a safe uh, rest of your week. Colleagues, thank you so much for this information. It has been amazing. We are going to get some good hires and some good community uh, based on what you've uh, been doing today. Thank you so much. Take care, everybody. Be well.